Good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is uh, Pamela Lopez, but I go by Z, and I am the director of Green Space Miami. Thank you all for joining us today. Uh, just to give you a little bit of background, Green Space Miami, whose mission is to be a catalyst for action through community partnership and collaboration, is the Green Family Foundation's new art space guided by the foundation's principles of inclusion, community empowerment, and education. The Green Space Initiative, we invested in highlighting the work of artists whose brilliance, ingenuity, vision, and character exemplified who and what Miami is all about. We're dedicated to providing a platform for these artists. And tonight's Green Space Miami talk features one of our inaugural and most brilliant artists, which is Morel Doucet. Morel is Haitian and a Miami-based multidisciplinary artist and an arts educator. His work portrays a contemporary depiction of the Black experience, cataloging a powerful record of environmental decay at the intersection of economic inequality, the commodification of industry, personal labor, and race. Doucet's Emmy-nominated work has been featured and reviewed in numerous publications, including but not limited to uh, Vogue Mexico, Oxford University Press, Hyperallergic, Biscayne Times, and Hype Beast. He graduated from the New World School of the Arts with a Distinguished Dean's Award for Ceramics. From there, he continued on at the Maryland Institute College of Art, receiving his BFA in Ceramics with a minor in Creative Writing and Concentration in Illustration. And joining Morel is our invited speaker, Jody uh, Melinder Farrell, a former Miami Herald journalist who is now Vice President of Development for the Everglades Foundation. This is a Miami-based nonprofit that works to restore and pr protect America's Everglades through science, advocacy, and education. She worked for the past 10 years at the Adrian Arts Center for the Performing Arts of Miami-Dade County, where she raised money to support artists' commissions, performances, and arts education for children. Jody has been a longtime board member of Sant Law, the Haitian Neighborhood Center, and has called South Florida home for over three decades. And there is our highly esteemed moderator, who is none other than Shauna Bukazad Sheldon, who was appointed executive director of the Museum of Contemporary Art, or MOCA, North Miami, in January of 2018. And Shauna oversees all aspects of the museum while ensuring the diversity that defines the museum's dynamic community is reflected in its exhibitions and programming. Under her leadership, MOCA originated exhibition Afro Cobra Nation Time was selected as an official collateral event of the 2019 Venice Biennale, marking the first time that a Florida institution has presented at that prestigious international exposition. During her tenure at the museum, Mocha North Miami has originated exhibitions that include Michael Richards' Are You Down? Alice Rahone's Poetic Invocations and forthcoming retrospective My Name is Marion, the first comprehensive retrospective of Polish-born Holocaust survivor Marion's life and work. Sheldon was previously the executive director of Miami's nonprofit exhibition space, Locus Project, for eight years, during which time the organization grew to an internationally recognized exhibition space where groundbreaking multidisciplinary artists presented career authoring works. Sheldon began her career at Casey Kaplan Gallery in New York, where she ultimately became its director. She served on the city of Miami Beach's Art and Public Places Community Committee from 2014 through 2019 and continues to participate in numerous panels and juries across the community. Today's talk is one of vast importance to our community. So join us as we discover how a paintbrush, a, a clump of clay, our Everglades advocates, with a shared purpose grounded on the desire to combat intensifying climate changes in our surrounding environments, are making all of the difference day in and day out. Now I'll turn it over to Shauna. Thank you so much, Pam, and thank you to Green Space Miami and the Miami Book Fair for bringing us together today. Morel, Jody, it's great for you to be here, and I'm looking forward to our conversation tonight. Morel, why don't we start with um, a bit of history about your practice? Um, absolutely. So before I begin, um, I would like to say thank you to Green Space, um, to Shauna and Jody for the work that you guys do. Um, it's an absolute honor to be here this afternoon. Um, so to kind of set things in motion, I would love to play this video that shows an overview of Haiti and really from the point of memory that I remember Haiti from a, 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 a child.
He is obviously not an Olympic swimmer. He is not a professional rock climber. He is not trying to establish a new record. He is just having fun. All right, the video cuts off there. Um, so I'm Haitian American. Um, I was born in the early 90s. My parents received political asylum. Um, my father was a doctor. My mother was a math teacher. Um, my father was essentially in, in prison under the reign of baby doc. And so as a doctor, you know, you take an oath in order to really serve everyone, regardless of their political affiliation. But unfortunately, the government did not believe so. And so my father was in prison um, under the reign of this president. And so when the U.S. intervened, it set things in motion and my parents were granted political asylum. Um, around that time, by the time they were get, getting ready to leave Haiti, I was age three. And even from that early age, um, the point of transformation and trying to adopt to these new environments, um, I knew I was no longer in Haiti um, based on the environment, the scenery that was happening within this, transi this transition period. Um, and so essentially I was plucked out of Haiti and dropped in Mobile, Alabama um, with, my, with, with, with my parents and my brother. And then they spent about six months in Mobile, Alabama. And then from there, they were completely culture chalk. And so they went from Mobile and then they moved down to South Florida and I've been here ever since. Um, I would like to go to the, to the next slide, please. So in terms of my family background, my grandfather is a farmer. Um, the image on the right of me holding that photograph is actually a recent photograph of my grandfather. Um, and he's like the biggest inspiration, you know, he's farming in his late eighties. Uh, he wakes up every morning around six o'clock, you know, he ties the cows, feed the goats, and then he heads off into the mountain to look for food, for yams, for plantains. And so I grew up on a farm, um, being around the environment. Um, I've always understood this connection between people and land. Um, and so within my work, nature is my first areas of exploration. I'm curious about it. The way flora flows, the color palettes, the textures, um, these are all the motifs and themes that I bring into my work as an artist. Um, next slide. So early on, so these are some works I was doing back in high school, my senior year of high school um, at New Old School of the Arts. And with these works, you're looking at ideas of the double conscious, as well as ideas of human and nature hybrid, and really our placement within nature. Um, in Western culture, we like to put man at the top of the hierarchy, but in other cultures around the globe, man is nowhere near the top. They're somewhere in the middle of things. And so with these works, um, either man is being engulfed by nature or man is coexisting with nature in a lot of these um, forms. And so like books like Metamorphosis, books like The Heart of Darkness, um, these are the stories that attracted me to how what a man would try to, to conquer the environment and then ultimately the environment proved to be too great for man to, to conquer because the is 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 wild and you can't conquer nature. Nature is a force. Um, and so a lot of these pieces in high school were exploring trains and elements in that. Um, next slide. And then from high school, these are some works I was doing as a sophomore and freshman in college. And again, kind of sticking in line with that same theme, um, looking at cultures around the globe. Um, these cultures would be classified as uncivilized, but to me, they're so in tune with the environment. Um, they have an in-depth knowledge of medicine, of of plants and dietary. And so these cultures, we look at them and I'm like, they're more advanced than we do. If they have a headache, they know how to treat it. 
if they have issues um, with birth, childbirth, um, everything they need is around them and they have this in tune adaptation with the environment. And so a lot of those works were celebrating aspects of these cultures. Um, and so, um, and then um, ceramic for me, it holds this unique place in our human history. Um, within our contemporary landscape, um, it even had the same monetary value as gold. And so, for example, if you went to someone in Europe who was of, of power, of status, um, in an indirect way of them to kind of portray their wealth, they would have a piece of porcelain somewhere in their house. Next slide, please. And so in a lot of the work, um, I started to really understand the material culture of clay. And then it developed into a different sense for me. Um, in college, I came in as, I, I, I came in with the mindset, I'm going to become a illustrator. Because at that time, I thought illustration was the best visual medium for communication and disseminating information. And ultimately, I learned it was so far from the truth. The image or the two drawings were some of the work I was doing as an illustration major, um, but then it also translated to ceramic in 3D form. So through drawing, I had to understand light, shadows, and how things were hitting the figure, and it translated in a lot of my work. Um, next slide. And so when it comes to inspiration, our thoughts and ideas, these are the articles that compels my work. Um, these are like articles within the last two to three years um, talking about, you know, seawater rise, the idea of a climate exodus, a climate apartheid. Um, here in South Florida, um, when it comes to our region counties, Key West is undergoing that right now. Um, there, within the last couple of years, there are some homes that were damaged that are beyond livable and these homes right now are pending to be purchased by the, the government and so these are things that the everyday local does not know about you know if you go down to the keys it's beautiful you're on a cruise you're having a great time but then you really don't understand the dichotomy between tourism and what is happening with the environment in these different cities and so um again these articles caught my eye um if Key West, you know, is a first blueprint of South Florida, of what could happen to Miami, then what is going to happen in the next 30 years, let alone 50 years within our lifetime that we're going to experience this? Um, next slide. Um, and then these are images in Europe. Um, and there's a quote that got cut off, but, um, oh man, I wish it's a beautiful quote. Um, and I don't want to butcher it. It's right here. Perfect. Um, Brandon, I can't, your name is on here, so I can't read the quote. Can somebody read it for me? I can see it. Yes, please. It? It's easier to imagine the end of the world than the end of capitalism. Mark Fisher. So there's this image, you know, of this woman drenched in water. And she's carrying this Louis Vuitton bag. <laughs> and so it's like this oxymoron for me is like, listen, she's drowning. But as long as this Gucci bag, <laughs> as long as, as this Louis bag is secure, she's good. Like <laughs> the shoes is in her hand and she's trenching through this water and they're having a good time. And again, it's like this oxymoron is like, is this how we're going to adapt? To climate, are we? Is, it, is this going to be this fun for all, um, or is it going to be greater? Like these, and then also I want to mention that um, with these images, a lot of these people are working class. Um, they come from wealth. You know, if you can afford a Louis Vuitton bag, then you probably are well to do. And so, people that are more affluent will probably be okay. They can relocate. They can travel. They can escape. But what happened to these communities? that don't have access to resources? How are they gonna survive in a city that is destined to drown? And so again, these are photographs for me that are very compelling. Um, next image, please. Um, and so through that exploration, um, I also started to take a deep dive into the ocean, um, looking at really the coral 
of the ocean. You know, the coral as an ecosystem is like our first nursery is where life begins. And so with these works here, these are from a series called Follicle Cells Bieta. And I'm looking at coral reefs, but this abstract reinvention of them through my Caribbean experience from Haiti. And so the color palettes come from colors of my childhood, the way the homes were painted. And then the textures are from textures that I find underneath the water. So I'm juxtaposing the fragility of the coral reef to that of my memory, to that of being a Black man navigating our society. So really, ultimately, the goal for this series was if we as a collective, as a humanity, can come together and save the coral reef, then potentially there might be hope for how Black and brown people are treated in our society. Um, and so within my work, there's double-edged swords. There's deeper meaning beyond the beauty of the surface. So I really encourage my viewers to take a deeper dive into the work, to go beyond the beauty and aesthetic of it, and kind of sit and dwell with the work to have a deeper understanding of the stories that I'm telling. Um, next slide. And then this is an article kind of referencing back um, what I mentioned about um, the Keys, where, you know, the Keys is our first climate exodus of South Florida, where these homes are damaged. The homeowners cannot live in them anymore. Um, people are biking in flood streets on, 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 on the beach. And this has become an everyday thing for our our community um, has been normalized. You know, when we have the, the high tides, the moon, there's literally a fish and a stingray in the middle of the street. It's, it's become this everyday language. Oh, I guess, you know, <laughs> you, know you, you drive by and there's a barracuda <laughs> in, the, in the road next to you. And so I find these, like, again, these absurd juxtaposition between climate and how our contemporary society has been handling it. It's weird to me. Um, well, let's continue. Um, and then most recently, um, this is like my ongoing body of work. Um, so this is a very um, special series that's dear to me. Um, and it's called um, Water Greaves in the Six Shades of Death. Um, with a lot of my work, I use allegories in order to tell a story. And so with this body of work, um, these are portraits of residents here in South Florida. And essentially, these are ecological portraits of the communities that I visit. Um, and these communities stem from Overtown, Miami, Adapada, Brownville, Miami Gardens. And essentially, is making this ecological map of South Florida through these residents. And ultimately, you know, if these communities become a, a point in our society where they cease to exist, then at least I have these portraits of the community that of, what, of who they used to make up. Um, and this is an ongoing series, as mentioned. Um, eventually, I would love to have over like 300 portraits that can have a, a one group exhibition that highlights the entire community of South Florida. Um, and these portraits, you know, different techniques, different processes, um, when I'm making them, you know, sometimes I meet the people in these neighborhoods. And so it's more besides this beautiful picture. Um, there's memories, there's connection, there's community, there's activism that's happening through these works that I'm making. Um, let's continue. And then, um, Jody, I don't know if you want to jump in as well. Um, these are some incredible photographs of our Everglades. And just the juxtaposition of my work with this photograph, for me, was really, really powerful. Um, so with this series here, um, they essentially represent facets of our society, um, more specifically with colorism um, and with communities of color. And so, for example, um, the brown figure is embellished with Danny Lyons. And when I think of the Danny Lion, as a plant, it does not have free will. It kind of blows with the direction of the wind. And so I use that analogy essentially for how communities of color are displaced. Whenever the developers come, they kind of blow in the direction of cheap, affordable housing. Um, so whatever they can find rent is where they're going to congregate and live. 
And then kind of like the white figure in the background embellished with these cherry blossom kind of, and those are like, are more sort of like our Asian Pacific community, kind of like they're always in the shadow, but they also suffer and experience these levels of threats that happen to them. And then the figure in the middle is more, it's embellished with this cobalt blue, which historically been connected to wealth. You know, so, th- so that figure is looking directly at the viewer. It's, it's, it's in the middle, it's centered. And so even in the arrangement of these works, I'm playing with a little bit of class and juxtaposing these small nuances that happen in our AVD that people don't notice and how it affects each community from one color to the next. And then when I looked at in the Everglades, the, the seagrass of a flora and fauna and how it's in- inclusive of different marine life and biodiversity. And so I think about, you know, what happened if climate essentially makes everybody on an equal level, on, on, on an equal field, if that is what essentially evil, it levels out the, the um, class that is happening in our um, society. Um, let's continue. Um, and then another juxtaposition um, called Tea with the Queen. So this teapot, um, I made it in response to Haiti having to pay the French money in reparation. Um, when we look at the value of that reparation today is equivalent to $22.3 billion is what Haiti had to pay the French for their independence. And so I kind of juxtapose that with the image of these birds, thinking the idea of flight, the idea of mentally escaping from this, um, thinking about what Haiti would look like if that money was given back to them and they were able to successfully invest it back into the infrastructure, into their education. Um, What would that do for the island? You know, we just had this massive exodus of these people from Haiti, um, from Haiti, from Chile, from Brazil, walking for two, two and a half months on foot in order to seek freedom in a better life. Um, so again, with freedom, the idea of, of, of birds, birds can fly to new areas, they can fl- fly to a new pasture, but when it comes to people and people that are less privilege, um, don't have access to opportunities and resources, then how can they escape? What is the future for them? And so I think ultimately what we saw in 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 the news with this migration is a result of that. When you have a country with no president, there's no leadership, um, people are desperate and people are, are going to track. You're going to escape. You're going to look for freedom for a better future. Um, let's continue. Um, this is another juxtaposition um, with a piece I'm holding in my hand. So this piece is called um, "The Black and the Berry, the Sweet and the Juice," and it's a it's a it's a it connects back, you know, to ideas of, of blackness and and to empower people. And I just think I juxtapose it with this alligator that I feel is empowered. It's like, listen, you took my you took the everyday away from me. And you built this pool here. This used to be my home. So I'm going to chill in the pool because you took away my home. And so, <laughs> and so this kind of like why I juxtapose them together. I feel like, you know, for me, um, when it comes to the idea of blackness, you know, I've had to navigate what it means to be black, what it means to be Haitian American. So these different identities that are, for me, very distinct, they don't intersect or they do intersect, but then culturally they're very different. Um, me trying to understand that I feel is how this gator is trying to process its environment. Um, let's continue, please. Um, this is another video um, that kind of shows, again, the ceramic work and working it in a way which elevates the work for what it is and using elements of nature as part of the aesthetic of it. Let's play. Let's play the video, please.
So when it comes to seawater rise and the materials that I'm using, um, I essentially call them like I'm using the carbon footprint. Um, when I go into a neighborhood, I gather the floor, the fauna, the rocks, the soil from that neighborhood, and then I then bring them into the studio in order to work with that process to define the work. So when you're looking at my portrait work, you'll notice there's different textures, different patterns, and all of those come directly from the plants that I'm gathering in these neighborhoods. Thank you. Um, let's move on to the next slide. Um, and so these are works um, most recently um, that were on display at the Museum in North Miami um, with Shauna. Um, Shauna, thank you so much for um, allowing these works to exist in the museum. Um, the amount of feedback, texts, tags on social media is beyond anything I could have hoped for. I think this project had a greater impact than what I even imagined of what this project was about. Um, and so a little bit context. So this is um, was a commission by MOCA um, called After the Rain Comes Light, Portraits of Resilience. And these are portraits of residents that live in North Miami. And this project was in direct response to kind of coming out of the pandemic. Um, and looking at the community of North Miami and how diverse, um, eloquent that this community is and really is contributed to the culture of Miami. And so we wanted uh, myself and my um, and the person who I work with, Stefan, are brought one of the ways to celebrate the community. And so through like careful selection, um, a, a open call and having people email us a lot of images and trying to select from these images. Um, these are two of the portraits that came from that open call. Um, and with Stefan, Stefan used a lot of um, liquid and oil and trying to juxtapose that with my style, which is more floor and fauna. So I think our two styles um, really merged in a very eloquent kind of way that was very poetic and very fluid at the same time. And people were was confused, like which one was my piece, which one is his piece. And like, it's actually both of our work as one and the styles, we wanted them to coexist and not compete with, with each other. And so I think these two pieces were great examples of that. Um, let's move on to the next image. And so these are um, two slides of that exhibition. Um, there were, they were, they were these outdoor banners that had um, the work on the outside of the museum. And then the original works were stationed inside of the museum as well. And between the that beautiful red wall with the placement of the yellow bench, uh, I think just the way the energy flowed in that room was really, really incredible. Um, next slide. Uh, and then kind of going back to Miami again um, with the gentrification of Little Haiti. Um, with our condo, with our housing market. Um, most recently, we had, unfortunately, the tragic incident in Surfside, um, where many, many lives were lost in this building. And for me, you know, as a local resident, I can't even fathom how the developers were, were so quick to buy the land and trying to just build right on top of it. Um, I know the families of these victims wanted to build some kind of memorial to honor the people there, and so, again, going back to that quote of capitalism, um, capitalism is like, no, you know, like they died too bad. This land is worth a lot of money um, and I'm going to pay good money for it because I have it. And so for me, the fact that developers were so quick to move on, you know, to not think about what just happened within less than a year, less than six months, um, they're so quick to move on. It really shows the these big pillars that we're dealing with as a society is ultimately, you know, climate change is important, but capitalism, if they can 
profit off of it temporarily, then it's going to happen. You know, they're going to build a new building there. They're going to build something there. You know, nothing stays. Um, and so these images for me um, are powerful because in order for change to happen, you need the community to be involved. You need activists. Uh, you have to protest. You know, one person can make a difference, you know, no matter how small you think it is, but it takes one person to change the mindset of somebody. Um, it takes one person to organize a protest. Um, and so really, um, our future is in the hands of everyone. And within that collective, if one person can stand up and create change, then potentially and hopefully something can be done before we reach a, a, a no point of return. Um, let's continue. Um, this is a work that I wanted to share. Um, so this is a project that I was newly commissioned by Ciroc. Um, I'm currently starting this work tomorrow. This is how brand new this work is. Um, this piece is called um, To Dream in Shades of Sapphire. Um, and it's going to go up hopefully by the end of this week. And it's going to be um, available to visit throughout Art Bowser Miami as well. And so essentially residents are going to enter this space and they're going to be immersed underwater. They're going to have these floating under these upside down palm trees, essentially recreating this underwater seascape within this space. And so, again, I'm, I'm bringing a little bit of, of, of allegory within the space where it, it feels fun. It feels interactive. But then I want residents to have this underbelly reminder, like this is Miami underwater, like this fun tropical art deco motif is Miami underwater. Um, I'm gonna collaborate with Nice and Easy, which is a, a local duo on this project. And so I'm really nervous, but excited to get this project going um, as soon as I can. Um, let's move on to the next slide. Um, and then ultimately, I like to include this in a lot of my my slides. Um, so as an artist, you know, I think I see myself as a cultural historian, um, really moving the culture forward. Um, as, as an artist, you know, I know there's a responsibility in the work that I'm making um, to be mindful because um, art has power, it has political power, it has political implication of the work. Um, and I'm aware of that, you know, I'm documenting the changing times. Um, and it's weird to do work from five years ago and have that work kind of comes back to me again. Um, and, you know, making the work visible, making the work tangible. Um, people don't read, you know, I'm an educator, my students don't read. And so I use image and other mediums in order to reveal different truths about the world around us, about the, um, the universe um, within the work that I'm making. Um, let's continue. Um, and then really, I'm hoping to help people, you know, around the world from different perspectives. You know, I've had my work um, in China, in Taiwan, in Australia. And so you make the work, and again, you have no idea the impact of the work until years later. Um, but you're so invested in the moment that you don't know <laughs> the impact of the work. Um, and then ultimately, like my, my artist model is create to serve. Um, create to experience, and then create to dream. Um, so I leave room for play within the work, even though the work is very serious, but I also leave a little bit of fun in exploration. Um, with ceramic, I always say the work is a collaboration between myself and the kiln because the kiln may not cooperate or that work may warp, it might melt a certain way. And so really there's always chance within the work that I'm making. Um, I have the idea, but the idea always is determined by these other factors that I can't control. Um, and so thank you. Thanks, Morel. Well, since you uh, brought the slide of your installation <laughs> at MOCA, I can't help but share the exciting news that the nine works that you and Stefan collaborated on were recently acquired by the museum for its permanent collection. So um, we hope to have them on view again very soon. And we're just so proud of that. You know, it's amazing to hear uh, you talking about your artwork and that it's been so consistent thematically since high school. <laughs> wow. <laughs> you know, and to hear how your practice is so clearly embedded in your interests and your personal history. You know, thank you so much for sharing that with us. 
Um, you know, Jody, we heard from Morel about how the history of water uh, ties into his art practice. Can you speak about uh, how the Everglades Foundation, uh, their goals around water and how this resonates with Morel's practice? Sure. Um, I was really drawn to Morel's work because, because of that integration of water and the integration of humans with, with um, nature. Uh, we're devoted to restoring and protecting America's Everglades. Um, you know, man diverted the Everglades back uh, to make space for agriculture and development. Um, we now realize that we need to send that water south. Um, and I, I think it's important to note that, you know, it all started with an artist. Um, she was a writer, but she put prose to, to paper. And it was Marjorie Stoneman Douglas who, who woke everybody up and, and um, brought us all to realize that it's not just a swamp. Um, it's part of our lives. It's intricately woven in, um, in how we exist in South Florida. Our, our water supply, our drinking water comes from the Everglades and relies on a healthy Everglades. Um, our economy, um, the water that we enjoy, that we play on and work on, all of those things are connected and that's what Morel's work really speaks to. Um, you know, in Miami, we all speak multiple languages and, and art is one of those languages. And I feel that Morel's work really speaks to people and, and makes this visceral connection. Um, and it's a constant reminder that this, you know, amazing one of a kind ecosystem in our backyard, um, we are connected to it. And it's, it's a great reminder of that. <laughs> Jody, you mentioned that uh, Morel's practice is really is a creative way of talking about climate change. Are there some examples of what the Everglades Foundation has done uh, to creatively talk about your work? Sure, I should mention um, the beautiful photographs that, that you brought up, Morel. Those, those were taken by one of our board members, uh, Max Stone, who's a photographer. Um, he's a National Geographic photographer, and I, I consider photography, I'm married to a photographer. I consider it a great art. Um, and you can, I mean, just from the images you saw that, that we shared, Max photography um, is, is an art form. I mean, it looks at, it provides uh, a glimpse of the Everglades that some people might not ever see otherwise. Um, and that alone, those photographs have been a very powerful tool for us in connecting people to the Everglades um, through that photography. Um, also, our chief scientist, Dr. Steve Davis, he's spoken on a number of panels um, such as this, you know, talking about how the science and the arts are really connected. It's only, you know, in recent modern history that people start to started to feel that they were not connected, the arts and the sciences. Um, now we know, you know, we're going back to that again, but, you know, through time, Audubon, um, you know, his, his drawings and paintings of birds, um, even da Vinci, you know, the, the arts and the sciences were always connected in the past. Now we have a fancy name for it, STEM, um, or STEAM. And, uh, and we have an education program that's devoted to educating the next generation about how our lives are connected and depend on a healthy Everglades. As, as part of that, we have a design contest for kids every year for these champion coins that we award. Um, to schools that really have gone above and beyond in, in creating a community awareness about the Everglades. And those designed, you know, we have a, a student designed piece every year. So those are, those are just a few of the ways we've integrated it. But we're always looking for, for more ways to make that connection. So cool, thank you. Morel, um, how has living in South Florida influenced your work? Man, so living in South Florida, um, you know, I, I, I've lived in Miami um, for over 20 years now. I remember, you know, before traffic was congested, <laughs> how easy, you know, we used to flow and navigate the um, city. And just, you know, over the last 20 years, seeing how congested it's become, um, seeing the cost of living has gone up. Um, it's really been... Um, really a um, culture shock, you know? Um, one thing I would notice, I would, I would mention is, um, I had no plan of coming back to Miami when I graduated from college. Um, I was originally gonna go to New York or it was gonna fly over to the West Coast. Um, and really what kept me here was, um, I was working in Baltimore um, as a arts administrator. And, but that position was a summer position, so they didn't have the funding to keep me for the year. And so I came home to visit 
for <laughs> a couple months um, since all of my friends were going on road trips. They were, um, you know, going abroad. And so my mom was like, you haven't been home in three years. Just come to Miami. I know you don't want to be here. Just come. And, you know, we can, and then you can apply for jobs from, from Miami. Um, and what happened was I applied to be, there was a, um, I was, you know, looking up different jobs. And then the Perez Art Museum came up. I'm like, the Perez Art Museum, what is that? And then I, and then through research, I found out that ma'am, which I grew up going to through um, elementary and um, through high school, was moving and they're going to a brand new location, a brand new museum. And I go, huh. I'm like, Miami's getting a new museum. And then I applied, and then um, I was accepted um, as one of their inaugural teaching artists for this new museum. And it really altered the course of my path. Um, so I, I went from wanting to leave Miami to seeing that Miami was actually trying to become this cultural destination. And the museums were becoming more serious about the work that they were doing. And then I ended up staying. And then through time, these other cultural institutions started to make work as well, like Ulai Arts, um, the Bake House. And so within the course of like eight years, Miami went from a city where artists were leaving because they were getting any support whatsoever to Miami becoming this new mecca of, of talent and having the resources poured back into the arts to support the talent that was here. Um, and so... I think I did well by saying. So great. Um, you know, you, <laughs> we're lucky to have you here. Absolutely. Uh, you had mentioned at one point that you grew up with an understanding that if you were good to nature, nature would be good to you. Can you talk about that a bit? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so that's a, a quote you know, my grandfather would always say to me, he's like, listen, if you cut down that tree, you know, you plant plant three or five new ones. Um, you know, if you take something from the, the corn, you know, give thanks to, to, to the husk, you know? Like, you know, if you're good to, to the land, you're good to the earth, um, it gives you a new harvest. You know, the harvest is good for you in, in the coming year. Um, and so I grew up understanding that, you know? Like, so whenever... Um, you know, would cut something, would always kind of pour libations to kind of say thank you to the earth. Um, thank you for providing this um, to us. Um, and so that was just kind of like my my mindset, you know. And really it was not into, in my um, years in high school, I started to understand that the world did not operate like my grandfather did. The world, you know, <laughs> consume and it takes more than it needs, you know, it takes a lot from the ocean than it needs. And so my understanding of how I grew up was not how everybody else viewed the environment. And I, I learned that the older I got. Beautiful. Jody, how does that fit into your work at the Everglades Foundation? Well, I, I mean, one of the things I, I smiled when I saw your photograph as a little boy, because you were very serious and, and your work is very serious, but I also detect a lot of hope in your work and, be, you know, beauty and hope. And, uh, and really that resonates with me because, you know, the restoring the Everglades is something we can fix. There's so many things that are overwhelming, um, right now with the environment, um, but there is a plan, you know, in place that was approved uh, more than 20 years ago. Our hope is to accomplish it by 2030. Um, we just need, you know, legislative willpower at the state and federal level to fund it, and that's that's what we focus on. But I I, I think what um, what I think we both have in common is that we do have hope for the future, and we do have confidence that we can fix some of the the problems that we've created. Mm. And, uh, and that's why I enjoy being at the Everglades Foundation, because it's, it's, it's something that we can accomplish. We know we can fix it. We broke it. Let's fix it. And, uh, and that, that hope, I find, resonates through Morel's work. That's so beautiful. Thank you. Um, all this talk about, you know, water and our environment, Morel, I can't help but think about the fact that you're going to be part of a really important exhibition at the Venice Biennial next year. The City of Water, <laughs> right? 
What is exhibiting there mean um, to you? So, exhi- so exhibiting there, um, first of all, I think is a I'm deeply honored um, to be able to show you know new work um, in Venice. Um, it's a little bit you know it's like a little bit of pressure, but then I just want to be authentic to what I've been making, you know. So I I definitely want to create something that's going to be impactful. Um, but I just want it to be as authentic to me and just be be um, truth. Thank you. It was so great to be able to hear from both of you and uh, talk this this evening. Uh, well, I'd, I'd like to come back on the screen and, and, and thank the three of you um, for an incredible conversation uh, at, at some place where I think something that Jody said was so critical. Uh, as of late, a lot of people have forgotten kind of that middle ground of the arts and sciences. And I think this is a great reminder of the fact that arts and sciences have have always been hand in hand for us to be able to create sustainable change and impact in our community. Um, so thank you, all three of you, for coming together and reminding us of the importance of this conversation and of what's going on in our in our surrounding communities and environments. Uh, today, I believe we, we weaved through the critical work being done by community leaders to educate, to advocate, and to push forth resolutions and reflections of the impacts of intensifying climate changes in our surrounding environments. Changes that we understand exacerbate disparities across communities. Changes that exemplify a force, I'm to use a word that Morel used earlier, that remind us of our collective ability, though, to chisel out of what seems to be set in stone a new path for the betterment of our society. On behalf of the Green Family Foundation, uh, we here at Green Space Miami would like to thank our speakers and our moderator for inviting us into this conversation Morel, your, your work brought to mind the understanding that artists importantly challenge pre-existing notions of our environment by rethinking and recontextualizing the conditions in which artists produced and presented to the audience. And, and Jody, you instilled in me today that we can all be trailblazing innovators in climate justice and activism if we understand the power of our storytelling through, again, connecting those arts and those sciences. Uh, I want to. I recall the words of Fabiana Rodriguez of the Center of Cultural Power, who said, "We need more artists in climate. Yes, but I think it's important for all people overall who care about climate to be committed to telling the intersectional stories." Uh, to our audience members, thank you for lending an ear, and we encourage you to, to to just share some of what you learned today with those around you. Be a catalyst of communication and actively join the conversation. And if you'd like to continue your learning, well. Just one way to do so is to stay connected with the individuals that you heard from today. You know, a, a lot of work uh, that Morel's uh, coming up, he's, he's mentioned today, uh, but I'd like to add on to everything that was said that he has a solo exhibition uh, with Gallery Mertis in Baltimore in the early spring of 2022. Uh, Jody has also shared with me that the Everglades Foundation New Programming for Families offers free virtual family night series, and you can register online to see their upcoming events. Uh, and research, right? Research by the Everglades Foundation's team of scientists drives all that the organization does, from advocacy efforts in the states and national capitals to its free K through 12 Everglades literacy education program. The team publishes regularly in scientific journals and it, they advance our understanding of our one of a kind ecosystem. I'll be sure to include the links to access these events and their rich library of resources in the information below. And as for MOCA in North Miami, uh, their next exhibition of the Polish-born artist and Auschwitz survivor uh, Marion opens on November 17th and will be open for you to visit up till March 2022. So please be sure to check it out and also look at their programming for Art on the Plaza, the temporary public art program that brings the museum out of the walls and out under the stars. Uh, I'll include MOCA's website below as well. Please, please, please be sure to visit because trust me, their programming calendar is never lacking. Once again, I'd like to thank everybody for being here. Thank you, Shauna, Jody, Morel. I mean, it was an incredible evening. Um, and for those of you listening, if you'd like to share your thoughts with us, you can find us on social media by looking up the Green G. Once again, thank you, everybody. And from Green Space Miami, have a great evening. <laughs>